Welcome back, my pet amigos. It is Chris Nichols here with Petapixel. Today, Jordan and I are both gonna be on camera because we both have played with the brand new Final Cut for the iPad. And I think we're gonna come at this from two very different perspectives. Let's get to it. Now, just to give you some backstory on why we're both on camera today, I actually do quite a bit of video editing for Bover Trout Fitters, making fly fishing videos for their channel. But it's a very different scale and very different application to what Jordan does here for the Petapixel show. Now, I normally use DaVinci Resolve. It's fantastic software, but I use like 20% of it, right? I'm really not getting into log editing. I'm not doing a lot of keyframing work, you know, not heavily grading anything. I really just want to build the timeline. I want to put some coverage in there, add some music, maybe retime some sections and export it for YouTube. So personally, having never really used Apple products, certainly not using a Final Cut workflow, and then picking up this brand new software for the iPad, I actually found it really easy to use. And I think first off, this software seems definitely more aimed at people like me, people who don't necessarily need to do a lot of heavy editing, who want a maybe easier workflow or an easier time at using the software. Everything on here seems very icon based. It's easy to find. Touch screen is very responsive. And so I found picking it up even just in two hours, I was able to fully create a timeline, get something exported. It was very straightforward having never used the software before. Now I found performance here to be incredibly smooth, very fast, certainly faster than my laptop at home. I should point out this is the M2 iPad Pro and this software will only work on M1 or M2 based iPads. But this is what Jordan and I were kind of hoping to do. He's got the iMac, he's got a MacBook Pro, he's got all the Macs. And so we were hoping that he could cut Final Cut projects on his Mac and then send it over to me here on the iPad. I could then import that project, you know, put photos where I want them. Uh, there's a cool drawing feature to talk about, you know, add some text, that kind of stuff, and then send it back to him so that he could finalize the video. Unfortunately, that's not possible yet. Hopefully it will be in the future. You cannot move projects from a Mac over to the iPad here and edit on this Final Cut. You can export projects on the iPad back to a Mac, okay, but then not back to the iPad. So it's really not working the way that we hoped. Now, another issue we found is that Jordan really likes to work off of SSD external drives. He'll actually cut and then save on those SSDs, which you can absolutely do on Macs. On the iPad, unfortunately, with this Final Cut right now, if you plug an SSD in, you can absolutely, of course, import to the iPad, but you cannot edit off of the SSD. So you basically have to import your clips over to the storage here. We only have one terabyte on this particular iPad uh, and do all of your working there and then export it off. So that also messes up with how Jordan normally likes to work. Now for me, I think this is gonna be excellent for my videos, right? I can easily import my clips, do everything. I found it very easy to learn. The only complaint that I would have with the overall workflow right now was the color grading. It's a little convoluted. You know, pick a clip, go into effects, then choose color effects. Then I can go in and I can adjust sliders, honestly, very much like you would do with Lightroom or Photoshop. And then I can copy and paste those onto other clips, but it is kind of clunky. I really wish I just had the color wheels that Jordan has. Click on a clip, bring up the color wheels, adjust, and you're done. So I know this might not be new to you, but new to me, you know, using a tablet and just having the surface to be able to edit, I do like how malleable this whole workspace is. I mean, I like that I can easily click things on and off, like my project media pool, uh, effects, you know, I can click that all on and off. The viewing options are far more flexible than I find with DaVinci, you know, where I can move things. I love this picture in picture feature where I can now have a much bigger timeline or space for my media pool and I can just move my project anywhere I want on there. I mean, the pen's cool too. The other thing that I like here is the drawing while we're on the top of the pen. Look, I mean, there we've got a clip. I can choose different pen sizes, different brush stroke thicknesses, change my color, and then I can say something like, you know, Chris is, we'll just stop with the, and then you can add what you think I am. But this kind of stuff is really fun, really easy to do, uh, very easy to implement, and that's really fun working on a surface like this. Let's say that I've done my whole project as a proper horizontal timeline, but then I want to then make a vertical video or something like that for TikTok. What's really cool is I can import those clips with animals and people into a different actual aspect ratio. And this software will actually intelligently frame those subjects. They'll say, oh, there's a person, there's your dog. I'm assuming you want it to fit properly for a square or vertical format, and it will do that for you. Of course, I can tweak it afterwards, but that's a big time saver. 
Now, when it comes to soundtracks, of course you can import whatever music clips you want, but Apple do provide some interesting soundtracks on the cloud, and these actually have a really unique feature. Let's say I'm doing a three minute timeline. I take one of those soundtracks, put it in, plop it in place, great. But then I wanna make a 30 second version of that clip. I could take that same soundtrack and actually just resize it right on the timeline, and what it will do is intelligently cut it so that it sounds appropriate for that new time frame. It'll keep the start and finish of the track, but it'll redo all of the middle of that audio track to make it sound appropriate. And that's a really cool time saver. I don't have to go in and chop things on the beat and try to retime it myself. Now I know it's early days, but the Apple provided soundtracks, I think in six months we're gonna be hearing a lot of this over and over and over. So hopefully Apple does add more soundtracks going forward. I'm sure they will. While we're on the topic of audio, another really interesting feature here if I've got like a really noisy street scene, you know, I'm talking, but there's a lot of noise in the background. The AI noise reduction tools for audio here are very simple, place it on there, and it actually is a very effective tool to get rid of any sort of annoying sounds. One direction you can go, maybe give it a good walk. Good chunk of river, a couple of kilometers to fish, move, keep moving down or moving up. I think the big takeaway for me is just that for a user like myself, who's personally, honestly, never used an Apple product, never used Final Cut, I actually found it quite straightforward to get started with it, to start editing. You know, Jordan and I both have some complaints over the interface and just how it affects your workflow. I'm gonna let him talk about that, but I'm also really excited to get DaVinci Resolve for the iPad and just see how that compares in the future. That all being said though, I think for the intention of more casual creators, this software is very powerful. Let's go to Jordan now and see how it works for somebody who's definitely more skilled and needs more out of the software. All right, Jordan here, and before I start talking about Final Cut for the iPad, I wanna give you a little bit of a backstory of my history with Final Cut. I've been a Final Cut user for over a decade, but I think a lot of editors remember when Final Cut X was first introduced, it was missing a whole pile of absolutely essential features. And I'm having very similar feelings right now with the new Final Cut for iPad. Now there's some hugely impressive new tools that we've been asking for on Final Cut for a very long time. It's been a while since we've seen a major update for it. However, when I go over to the iPad version, I sacrifice a lot of stuff that I find really important. In terms of adjusting the actual look of your video, we've got these new slider-based controls, and I think that's gonna be really intuitive, especially for people who are coming from photo editing software. Problem is it's just not very efficient. I mean, you actually have to like scroll up and down to see all the different levels of the image that you can edit. Now I could probably get used to this slider-based interface, but I just wish I had the option to use a regular three-way color correction wheel. This is the same mistake Apple made with Final Cut X version one, where we didn't have color wheels on that. There was a big uproar, they added them later. I hope they do the same thing with this. As well, log footage is no longer something that just professionals are using. A lot of consumers and enthusiasts are shooting with log video to get the most dynamic range out of the camera, and the LUT implementation is bizarre on this. So say you're finished editing your project and it's time to start moving on to the grade. Well, the LUT tool is actually not found anywhere in your timeline settings. You'll have to go back to the browser, which is where you choose which clips you want to bring in the timeline. Remember the names of those clips, go find them there and apply the LUT to it. It just seems like an incredibly unwieldy process as well. You're just toggling that LUT on and off. There's no way to adjust the strength of the effect. As well, I can't choose where in the order of operations that LUT is applied. On Final Cut for Mac, I can just use custom LUT as an effect, drop it on and move it anywhere in that sequence. I don't have the option in Final Cut for iPad. Now when I'm initially assembling a project, I've actually found this version of Final Cut quite intuitive. It's really when you start getting into the very fine edits where you're looking at it frame by frame, you know, in terms of what parts you're cutting out, or especially if I'm doing audio keyframes where I wanna very smoothly move the audio up and down throughout a clip, there I've found the interface incredibly fiddly and you are gonna to have to rely on the new jog wheel. I actually do really like this, makes it easy to move frame by frame, but it does seem like a bit of a jump when you're working on something in the timeline, then you're over to the jog wheel in order to make the fine adjustments. I'm sure, again, it's something I would get used to, but after using Final Cut on the iPad for a little while, I still struggle with it. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that was driving me crazy, but it might almost be worth it for the fact that the performance on Final Cut for the iPad is absolutely outstanding. I compared it to my M1 Pro in my MacBook Pro, and for a real stress test, I put two 8K clips on screen at the same time, one larger than the other, applied some color corrections and exported them as a 4K H.264. This is the kind of stuff I would do all the time. 
First of all, when I was actually previewing that on the iPad, the playback was absolutely silky smooth at 24 frames per second, where it was struggling a little bit on my MacBook Pro. But on top of that, it took over a minute for the MacBook Pro to export that file, where we got it in 43 seconds on the iPad. It is substantially faster, playback performance is smoother. It's very nice when you're editing. So for my work, I really don't think it makes sense to work with Final Cut on the iPad. There's just too many limitations there. Largely, the fact that I'm working on a terabyte and a half documentary right now, I have a one terabyte iPad, it actually won't fit on there. So until they give me the ability to edit off an SSD, it just makes no sense for my workflow. But yet, I'm still really excited because I do think this shows a lot of the features that we will hopefully see in the future on Final Cut for Mac. As well, I should mention that Final Cut for iPad is the first time that Final Cut has required a subscription payment program. And I do hope we see a lot of the really cool features that we've seen here in the Mac version in the future, but I'm also a little concerned that we might see the Mac version also move over to a subscription-based model to get access to these cool features. Only time will tell, but I'm very curious. So you know what, I don't think we really want to look at it as a competition between Final Cut for iPad and Final Cut for Mac. I mean, the fact of the matter is, we both want to be on camera because these software programs are made for completely different people. I absolutely can see myself doing a lot of projects on the iPad. Jordan's going to absolutely continue to do his projects on the Mac. And do we wish that some features would go from the iPad to the Mac and from the Mac to the iPad? Absolutely. But the real main issue that we have is actually that the two programs just don't communicate well with each other. And that's really strange. We were hoping that we could do a lot of collaboration from the iPad to the Mac and back, and that doesn't seem to be something that's possible right now. So out of all improvements that we want to see going forward, that is what we want to see, that the two can work together much easier. Well, we both hope that you found this educational in explaining the differences between the two software programs and which one's better for you. Also, this I think is our first software review ever, so that's good. I mean, we're trying to branch out on other things. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Let us know if you want to see more stuff like this in the comments below please follow Instagram and Twitter and while you're at it if you haven't already subscribe to the channel click that notification bell we got a lot more stuff coming out we don't want you to miss it we'll see you soon with more episodes on Pedophist